Anyway, Sheriff Mack is a fifth generation Arizonan. Um, his father had served in the FBI for nearly 25 years. Um, and Sheriff Mack grew up and attended school in Safford, Arizona. And he graduated from Eastern Arizona College and Brigham Young University. And uh, he spent 11 years with the Provo, Utah Police Department, and then moved back to Arizona to run for Graham County Sheriff in 1988. Uh, he was elected a couple times there, and that's where uh, he had some great experiences, which he's going to talk to us quite a bit about uh, this evening or afternoon. And so, with that, I want to welcome Sheriff Richard Mack. Well, it's a thrill to be here, and I thank all of you for being here. This is my first time to see that. And as I've said in several interviews I've already done today, um, I consider uh, being here a waste of time if we're not doing a fundamental thing called return to our Constitution. If we're not doing that, then I believe we're wasting our time. If we're just playing politics, then uh, I don't see really any solutions there, especially nationally. Uh, I have nothing but disdain for Washington, D.C. politics, and uh, because I just don't see anything there that follows the founding fathers or the principles that America was founded upon. Uh, none of us in this room and no one in Washington, D.C., even all of them put together, are not smarter than the founding fathers. They knew what they were talking about, and if we follow what they established for this country, we're going to win. We are the generation that will decide whether or not we're going to continue as a constitutional republic or whether we're going to uh, succumb to the temptations and political correctness to make America just another socialistic republic. Uh, that, that is exactly uh, what the Constitution was designed to prevent. And uh, the solutions, my friends, are behind us. We must return to those basic fundamental principles or America is doomed. You destroy the foundation and the rest of America will fall. And the foundation of America is the United States Constitution. That is my message. That is what I've dedicated my life to. Uh, I have now formed a group called the CSPOA, Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. You'll go to our website and you can see that there's literally hundreds of sheriffs across this country now pursuant to this great movement to stand against the gun control proposals of the federal government and Mr. Obama and Mr. Biden. And uh, the best way that we take America back, I believe, is county by county, sheriff by sheriff, and state by state. Forget Washington, D.C. Let's make Washington, D.C. irrelevant. And we can, and there's solutions, and we're seeing it every day. Do you know that Sheriff Brad Rogers from Elkhart County, Indiana, just a, uh, about a year ago, threatened FDA agents with arrest if they came back to bother an Amish farmer in his county again. They, he said, if you don't come back with due process and a duly signed warrant, then don't come back or I will arrest you for trespassing. That is what we're talking about. Awesome. That is America. Those are the ideals. Now, real quickly, and I'm sorry I'm just kind of busted into this because normally this is about an hour and a half, two hour presentation. And we've got to close this pretty quickly. Uh, so I want to just get into what brought me to the point of suing my own government. A real David and Goliath story. I sued the Clinton administration. You know, and I'm really good friends with Joe Arpaio, and I always kid him. When he and I are on the same stage, I always, I always go after him. You know, because he wrote this book uh, called The Toughest Sheriff in America. And I say, Joe, you know, because you're my friend, I won't sue you. Because he goes, why would you sue me? And I said, because you're not the toughest sheriff in America. He goes, oh, I, I guess you think you were. I said, of course. This is really elementary. He goes, well, how do you figure? I said, look, Joe, you took on the illegal aliens, the prostitutes, and the street gays. I took on the Clintons. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, you know, there's always some wise guy in the audience that goes, same difference. You know? <laughs> Seriously, that happens all the time. <laughs> so, I, I want you to know what happened to me. I just wanted to be a cop. I just wanted to be a sheriff. I wasn't there to be an activist. I wasn't there. I didn't run for office in 1988 after serving 11 years as a cop and detective and undercover narcotics officer. Um, uh, in fact, on the back of my book, uh, The Magic of Gun Control, you can see my undercover picture. And uh, I, I show the dichotomy of the, 
straight laced you know, conservative guy that I, will, that I am and always have been. The only time I ever smoked pot in my entire life was when I was a cop. Never did it before, never did it since. And no one hates drugs more than I do, but I can honestly tell you that that taught me a lot about the farcical nature of the drug war. And, uh, but this isn't a topic about that. So anyway, uh, afterwards, I bring that up because I have several books in the back, and if any of you want to pick up my book, I'll be signing those uh, on your way out. But uh, I, I just wanted to be a cop, and after my undercover assignment, I was assigned back to patrol. And what do patrol officers do? Smoke we write tickets. Or smoke <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we're out writing tickets. And uh, so this, I'm parked at a, at a uh, four-way stop at 600 West, 300 South in Provo. And it's right next to Franklin Elementary School. And I'm the only living person within 300 yards of this intersection. I'm in a marked car. I'm in a police car. And I'm only about 20 feet from the stop sign and from the intersection. And this lady runs a stop sign right in front of me. <laughs> like she can't see me? I'm, I'm the only thing there! <laughs> and I looked inside her car, and I could and I could immediately surmise why she did this. She had like maybe some of you ladies can uh, uh, relate to this. She had like three or four, maybe twelve kids, and they were just going crazy. It looked like the Tasmanian devil inside the car. <laughs> and so what happened is she was trying to settle her kids down, and she got so preoccupied with that she lost track of where she was on the road. Went through the stop sign, and she's in the middle of the intersection, and she's going. And she looks over at me, and she just throws her arms up in the air, kind of like that, off her hands off her steering wheel, she would, and then put her head like that, as if to say, what else could go wrong today? <laughs> and she immediately pulls over. She doesn't even give me a chance to turn on my red and blue lights. And you know how we like to do that. <laughs> Cops love turning up. And so I walk up to her car, and she already has her license and registration. Some of her kids are still really acting up. She may have told them, you know, oh, the cops here, you got to settle down. So some of them did, but some of them did not. And they were too young to understand it. And she has her license of registration out the window. She's kind of going like this. <laughs> and this lady is about to change my life forever. And she never said one word to me, nor I to her, except, can I see your license of registration? But she already had to me. So I don't remember saying a word to her, but I know she never said a word to me. And um, she, you know, she wasn't crying or fighting or, officer, please don't write me. You wouldn't want to write your mom a card, you know, a ticket, I mean. You wouldn't want to write your wife a ticket, would you, for taking care of all your kids? That's all I was doing. And I already knew that. And uh, she never made any excuse. This lady was having a horrible, horrible day. And she was just staring right through the, past the steering wheel out the windshield of her car. And to me, I was glad. I get another ticket, and I don't even have to fight with her about it. Yay! This is easy. So I write in the ticket, and at the end of the ticket, the officer signs his name and his serial number, which I just did. And then I pause, and I look down at this cruddy old car this lady was driving. It was obvious. She couldn't have afforded this ticket if it was a $5 ticket. And the car was like a dilapidated, cruddy old dots in the station wagon, <laughs> and primer, primer gray showing through. It wasn't worth 250 bucks. And her kids were very unkempt. And um, I looked at her, and I saw how depressed and discouraged she looked. I looked at her kids, still some of them fighting and crying and acting up. I looked at her cruddy old car, and then I looked at me. It was the most penetrating gaze I'd ever felt in my life. I said, Mac, is there anything you're doing here that's helping this family? Is there anything you're doing here that's bringing honor to the badge you wear on your chest? And I didn't like any of the answers that I gave. And I was very ashamed of what I had become. A ticket-writing jerk, losing his sense of humanity and compassion. And I walked away with the ticket in hand, and I never said a word to her. I handed back her license and registration, and I walked away with the ticket. 
The police station was about three blocks away. And I went there and tore the ticket up, put it in the trash can, and the rest of the night, the rest of the shift, I was wondering why we have government, why I was a cop, why we have police, why we do this to people, why we write all these tickets, and what are we doing to really help people? Well, I fundamentally had to start over. I wanted to start over. I had to start over. And I wanted to find the answers. Why do we have government? Why do we do this? And why am I a cop? Well, I didn't see any answers that night. And the next day, I come back to work early. And I was walking around, and I ended up in the uh, city clerk's office. And I, w I just walked in there, and I was just standing around. And she goes, uh, Officer Matt, can I help you? And I said something that, to this day, I don't know why I said it. She go, I go, um, when I took my job, did I take an oath of office? I don't even know why I said that. She goes, of course you did. You're required to. You signed it. I said, I signed it? And before I could ask, she burned me a copy and handed it to me. And now, my good friends, I'm telling you the truth. I'm going to go quit my job. Because I looked at that oath. And I'm a liar and a hypocrite. And I will maintain that there is no way you can keep your oath of office if you've never read and studied the Constitution. And I never have. I swore an oath and signed my name, raised my right arm and promised in God's name to uphold and defend, protect and preserve the U.S. Constitution and the Constitution of Utah. And neither one allows any gun control. Neither constitution, most state constitutions are stronger on the right to keep and bear arms than is our own federal constitution. And so, and I didn't even know anything about the right to keep and bear arms. I didn't, at that point, I didn't. My chief of police said that only soldiers and police should keep and bear arms. I didn't know to disagree or not. Now I totally disagree. My first book that I ever wrote is entitled, From My Cold Dead Fingers. You can tell I did a little study, <laughs> and I did. And then the sequel, of course, is The Magic of Gun Control. And uh, my most prolific book is called The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope. Because I know, having been a sheriff, that the sheriffs can interpose on our behalf and have the obligation to interpose on our behalf to be the guards and the guardians of our Constitution and our American liberties. And that what is and what is not enforced in their county is up to them. And so, thus, my activism and the reason that I have the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, CSPOA.org. And so, I decided that instead of quitting my job, that I would quit being a liar and a hypocrite. I think they call that repentance. And so, I changed my life. And not only did this lady change my life that day, but I think the good Lord used her to hit me over the head with a two-by-four. That there's a lot more important things than, than uh, arresting people for smoking pot and writing traffic tickets all day. And so I started studying the Constitution and I loved it, especially the Bill of Rights. And the Eighth Amendment hit me the hardest. What's the Eighth Amendment? No cruel and unusual punishment, nor excessive fines or bail imposed. And that's not an exact quote, but that covers those three principles. Let's see, are tickets excessive? <laughs> and are they bail? Yes, that's what you promised. That, you know, it's a, your signature on the ticket is in lieu of posting bail. And so, yeah, they're excessive fines and they're excessive bails, and sometimes they're cruel and unusual. You can get some fines up to $1,200 just for a simple speeding in California. That's yeah, crazy. But it's okay because the government said we could do it, right? Whatever government says we can do, then we just go ahead and do it, right? And that makes it moral and correct and proper. No, it does not. And we, the cops and sheriffs of this country, are not a bunch of go-along soldiers and robots that you can program just to follow anything the legislatures do. What if sheriffs actually told legislatures, no, I'm not doing that? That would be highly appropriate because freedom and our oath supersede state statutes, federal statutes, county resolutions, or anything that is repugnant to our Constitution, I, as an oath taker and an oath keeper, must oppose it. Are there some gray areas? Yeah, maybe. 
maybe sometime, but very rarely. I know what gun control is, and I know that gun control in America is against the law. And therefore, as a constitutional guard, I must oppose such. I know what land rights are, and I know that when the IRS comes in and starts confiscating land and cars and property and bank accounts without due process, even with them, even if they have due process, I'm still against it. Because everything they do is so ruthless and Gestapo-like that you can't support this kind of thing. And we have this in America, and the destruction of families and businesses and people, somewhere, somehow, we've got to stop it. Is it going to happen in Washington, D.C.? No. So how do we take America back again? <coughs> county by county, <coughs> sheriff by sheriff. And throughout my studies, I, I was just thrilled with learning about this. It was all self-education. And then while I'm going through this process of educating myself, an announcement at Provo Police came from the state of Utah regarding police training. And it said, a seminar being uh, offered by Peace Officer Standards and Training. That's the state bureaucracy. And it was entitled, Constitutional Studies for Law Enforcement Officers. And the instructor's name was Dr. W. Cleon Scout. And he used to work in the FBI with my father. So I said, I'm going to that. It was at the University of Utah about 1983. I'd been a cop for a little over three years. And at this seminar, two days of police training, I was converted. The conversion was complete. In two days of police training, we didn't learn anything about shooting guns or driving cars faster or police safety tactics or the Carroll Doctrine or the Miranda decision. We learned about the making of America. We learned about the Founding Fathers. We learned about the balance of power. We learned about the upside down triangle where we the people are at the top and the federal government and president are at the very bottom. You know, seriously, every public official has sworn an oath to uphold and defend that great document and the principles of freedom that our country was founded upon. From the dog catcher all the way down to the president. Dog catcher, president. Yep, yeah, that's the right word. We all take the same oath of office. And the question is, are we going to make sure they toe the line and keep their word? America is now in the most critical time of our history since the Civil War. We must stand. We must do more. We must have local officials who know and understand the Tenth Amendment, state sovereignty, and states' rights. Can any of you constitutional scholars tell me who is constitutionally, lawfully, and legally required to enforce state sovereignty? Do any of us pretend for a moment that that's the federal government? Are you kidding? They're the ones destroying it. Do you really think that they have unbridled power because they have the supremacy clause? Well, Scalia, in, our, in this Supreme Court decision, and that's in this little booklet, the highlights of the Matt Prince case, my case, are in this booklet. And he talks about that very issue. Do you know that he clarifies the supremacy clause in here? Because it doesn't grant carte blanche to the federal government. If it did, it would negate the entire Constitution, especially the Bill of Rights, and the Tenth Amendment and Ninth Amendments particularly. No, my friends, the federal government does not have unbridled power unless we as the states allow it. We form the federal government. We, the states, and we, the people, form the federal government. And I'm going to show you some things here. I will show you the evidence of this. You will see this for yourself. And so as I was going through my constitutional training and Dr. Skousen finished me off with the conversion of his two-day seminar, five years later, Continuing on in law enforcement, I decided that I wanted to run my own department and took the huge chance of moving back to Arizona, my hometown, and running for Brand County Sheriff. I hadn't even lived there for 12 years. I had never been a cop in Arizona. I had never served in law enforcement in my hometown, ever. And I walked back into town and said, hey, make me your head law enforcement officer. And I won. And four years later, I re was reelected. And about a year later, Bill Clinton signed the Brady Bill into law. And on January 21st, 1994, 
three agents of the DATF showed up at our sheriff's meeting and said, you sheriffs have to go along with the Brady Bill because Congress said so, and you guys have to conduct criminal history background checks on everybody <coughs> in your county who wants to buy a gun. And we're getting these orders from the BATF. And we're all looking at each other and going, since when do we work for these guys? And how do these guys give us orders? Well, they said, Congress said so. We don't work for them either. They don't pay our salaries and they didn't put me into office. They're not my boss. And that's what we, that's what we all said. And then at the end of the day, I'm the only one standing there saying, we have to do something about it. The rest of the sheriffs are going, you can't fight City Hall. There's nothing we can do. And I left very discouraged and I drove home. And by the time I got home three hours later, I decided it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm going to sue my own government. I'm going to sue the Clinton administration. Oh, goody. I get to sue Billy Bob and fight Janet Reno. Nothing ever happens to people who do that. I'm going to be fine. And scarier yet, I had to go in the house and tell my, my wife. And I thought she, she would do the right thing and talk me out of it. She didn't. This is where the decision was really made. She totally supported it. And so the next day, I went to work, and I wasn't a member of any national organization. There was no Tea Party Patriots or anybody then, you know. I wasn't a member of the NRA or nothing. I didn't even hunt. I didn't care about hunting at all. I didn't care about freedom. And a gun in my hand made me feel free. And a gun in your hand is an expression of freedom, self-defense. Has nothing to do with hunting. Never did. They try to make that argument, and that that diminishes the role of the Second Amendment entirely. And so, my under sheriff was a life member of the NRA, and I, I asked him if the NRA had a toll-free number where I could call and get advice, because I really needed some heavy-duty advice about this. I called the NRA and finally landed in the office of one Richard Gardner. He was a lawyer. I told him who I was and what I wanted to do, and he said, Sheriff. Sure. We've already been preparing the paperwork on this case, and we've been praying that you would call. Oh, I was thrilled. And so uh, I got my own lawyer to work with the NRA, and on uh, February 28, 1994, the very day the Brady Bill took effect, my lawyers, my <coughs> lawyers, filed in federal district court in Tucson, Arizona, in the courtroom of one Judge John M. Rowe. If you remember, he was the judge who was murdered at the assassination attempt of Congresswoman Giffords back in uh, January 8th of 2011. My judge on this case, and he was an amazing man, and I'm going to show you some of the things he did here, but I want to show you the evidence. You know, I was a detective, and so I don't want to spell off a bunch of Richard Mack opinions, Sheriff Mack opinions. I want to show you the evidence. And this all boils down to uh, what I believe first fundamentally is this. You had a family that loved you. You had a child that you thought made a difference. That you thought was honorable. And then you see this. I'm afraid of fighting any deeper. You took an oath. If you recall, when you first came to work for me, and I don't mean to the National Security Advisor of the United States, I mean to his boss. Why do we take that oath? Do any of you know why we take that oath? 
We swear allegiance to the United States Constitution. Do we have any clue why we take it? It is required by law. There it is. Article 6 of the United States Constitution. The Founding Fathers required it. So that all three branches of government, all three of us, executive, legislative, and judicial, all have the same goal and purpose. To uphold and defend the Constitution. Protect the God-given rights that the Founding Fathers established to be protected in this land. Look at this. Senators and representatives, the members of several state legislatures, and all executive. Who does the sheriff work for? Are we judges? Are we legislators? No, we're the executors of the law. Executive branch. And both of the United States and of the several states shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. There you go. The supreme law of the land. That's why we all swear. It's just a little ceremony. We're liars right after that. That must change. We must be oath keepers. We must keep our word. And uh, Judge Roll really talks about this in just a minute. But I also want to see, I want you to make sure. This is James Madison in the Virginia Resolution. And he talked about the responsibility of the states is to interpose its power to prevent the federal government from victimizing its people. It's the job of the states. The purpose of state sovereignty, my friends, is to protect the sovereignty of the individual, not the geographical boundaries of the state. That's nothing. The purpose of sovereignty in states' rights and the Tenth Amendment is to protect the individual liberty of the citizen. And that's why we interpose. And last year at our CSPOA convention, we gave the interposer of the year to Sheriff Brad Rogers in Indiana for doing what he did to protect an Amish farmer. And the Amish farmer doesn't even vote. It wasn't a political vote. It was the right thing to do. Here's Judge Rowe. In one sentence, he surmised my entire motivation for filing my lawsuit. He said I was forced to choose between keeping my oath. This is the second time I heard the oath ever mentioned, except from James Earl Jones. Okay? Judge Roll said it in his decision, in his ruling. I was forced to choose between keeping my oath or obeying the law. Shouldn't we ask every cop that, if you're put in that quandary, shouldn't we ask every sheriff and every public official what if the state legislature, what if the federal legislature forces you into the quandary of having to choose between upholding, defending, protecting, and preserving the U.S. Constitution or obeying stupid laws? Which one are you going to do? Oh, well, it's not me. It's not for me to pick and choose. You're right, Sheriff. You swore to uphold and defend the Constitution. Not follow back at politicians. Come on. Do you, do you really realize what we live, what kind of uh, government we live? It's not even a democracy anymore. It's a bureaucratic dictatorship. Do you know that the bureaucracies, the hundreds and hundreds of state and federal bureaucracies, they want you to believe because they pretend so good and they even get some judges to support them. And even if they do, it doesn't make it right and it doesn't make it so. Because they want you to believe that their bureaucratic policies and regulations supersede the Bill of Rights. They want you to believe that. They want you to believe that their bureaucratic policies supersede your right to the pursuit of